Today, we're taking a look at the Avro Bison, which was an exceedingly ugly looking biplane that was built in the early 1920s. It was built to the same specification that also led to the marginally less offensive looking Blackburn Blackburn, which was Air Ministry Specification 3 21. This called for a carrier capable aircraft that could perform reconnaissance and fleet gunnery spotting duties. After receiving submissions from both Avro and Blackburn, the Air Ministry ordered three prototypes from each company. Avro was quickest off the mark, and their first prototypes would be complete within a matter of months of the initial contract being issued. Although structurally similar to Avro's other biplane designs, the shape of their new model 555, being purely functional and dictated by the naval requirements, was a little short of being utterly grotesque. A large part of this can be attributed to the placement of the pilot's cockpit, which was located high up and in front of the top of the wing, with the engine cowling sloping away at a steep angle to provide good visibility for carrier landings. This gave the aircraft a side profile that resembled something along the lines of a biplane that had run headlong into a wall, with its nose buckling outward in a comical fashion. Within this squashed nose was the power plant dictated by the specification, a 450 horsepower water-cooled Napier Lion. It was installed on a special mounting which also formed a work stand when the engine was removed for maintenance, something that was later well regarded during carrier operations at sea, where ease of maintenance was of course of paramount importance. The fuselage was of tubular steel construction, with the central part being clad in plywood and the rear with fabric, and the nose was protected by aluminium sheeting. The aircraft was to have a crew of four, a pilot, a navigator, a radio operator, and a gunner. The steep slab-sided fuselage housed a central cabin for the navigator and radio operator, and it offered enough room for them to be able to stand unimpeded. Its size allowed for a whole suite of navigation and radio equipment, as well as a complete plotting table, which was considered quite a luxury for 1921. However, at some point in the design process, it must have been realised that a window was needed for the observer to, well, observe, and apparently the best thing to use was what appeared to be a regular window from a bathroom supply shop two of which were installed on each side of this cabin, which gave a remarkable view of the outside world, whilst at the same time managing to look totally alien in terms of design and aesthetics when it came to aircraft. Unlike the navigation crew, the pilot and rear gunner did not enjoy the luxury of an enclosed cabin. The pilot's cockpit was open to the elements, as was the rear gunner station, which was on a raised platform that could be accessed from the central cabin. The gunner was armed with a single lowest gun on a scarf ring, and the pilot had the use of a forward-firing Vickers machine gun. The first prototype was completed in the autumn of 1921. It had the upper wing mounted directly on top of the fuselage, three arrestor claws fitted to the axle of the undercarriage, and cutaway wing roots to provide additional downward visibility. It was flown for the first time at some point in October 1921, though there appears to be no exact date of when this happened, and problems encountered during its initial flights led directly to changes on the second and third prototypes that were still under construction. The biggest issue found had been a lack of longitudinal stability, the cause of which appeared to be the interruption of airflow over the upper wing caused by the strange shape of the nose and the placement of the pilot's cockpit. As a result of this, the wing shape on the second prototype was reversed, and the upper wing was raised by approximately 15 inches on a series of struts. This also permitted the insertion of a sliding communication hatch between the central cabin and the cockpit, which allowed the pilot to better communicate with his crewmen without the need for screaming above the wind. Some problems with lateral stability had also been noted, and to improve this, the rudder was enlarged and auxiliary fins were mounted under the outer ends of the tailplane. Side bracing struts were also added to the bottom centre section of the tail, and an improved metal tail skid was installed to help with landing. The third prototype was almost identical to the first, but it retained the modified tail of the second, 
and this aircraft was used as the template for the first batch of 12 production aircraft, which were designated as the Avro Bison Mark I. Bison 1s did not have the raised upper wing of the second prototype, as this modification was still being tested when production began. As a result of this, the first Bisons suffered from poor performance, especially at speeds below 80 miles an hour. One of the first Bisons was also converted to a float plane and tested at Felixstowe, but its performance was so abysmal that its sea trials were abandoned after the preliminary test flights. The modifications made to the second prototype finally materialised in the next production batch, which was designated as the Bison Mark 1A. Produced under specification 16-23, they featured all the changes of the second prototype, plus the additional switch from a four-blade propeller to a two-blade unit. Later production models had their arrestor gear removed, and the upper wing raised even further, and these would be designated as the Bison Mark II. Also, unlike the Mark I model, which had dihedral on both the upper and lower wings, the Mark I-A and Mark II had no dihedral at all. After passing acceptance trials, which somehow deemed the ugly and vaguely unstable Mark I suitable for service, the first Bisons reached operational units in the middle of 1922. Though originally designed for carrier use, the first operational Bisons were used for coastal reconnaissance duties, replacing the Westland Walrus biplanes of No. 3 Squadron. The Bison would not actually reach fleet air arm service until No. 3 Squadron itself was disbanded in April of 1923, after which No. 423 Fleet Spotter Flight received its first consignment of Bison 2s. They were initially operated out of Gosport, like No. 3 Squadron, but they were later used in the Mediterranean aboard HMS Eagle. Other Bisons would find service with the home fleet aboard HMS Furious, and units from No. 448 Flight also operated from Malta during much of the 1920s. In service, the Bison was not particularly well regarded, and not just because of its offensive looks. Even with its modifications, it was found to be heavy and cumbersome at slow speeds, and its sluggish top speed of 110 miles an hour meant that it often struggled with strong headwinds. This made it less than ideal as a reconnaissance aircraft, and not particularly useful as a gunnery spotting unit either, as it flew at such a slow pace that it would be a sitting duck for naval fighters or enemy anti-aircraft batteries. Despite their drawbacks, the Bisons enjoyed a fairly long service life, operating throughout the 1920s, before finally being retired at the end of the decade. Though they were woefully slow, they did, technically, perform the requirements to which they had been built. They were eventually replaced by the Ferry 3F, the latest iteration of an aircraft design that actually predated the Bison itself by almost four years. The Ferry was also considerably easier on the eyes, which would have made a nice change for the crews of the fleet air arm. A similar fate awaited the Bison's equally ugly competitor, the Blackburn Blackburn, but I'll spare the ugliness of that aircraft for another day. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the patrons, with a special shout out to Kevin, Deliado, Bain, FB, Christopher R, Tronathon, Eric Hindman, John Austin Jr, Ray Colotta, Keith Tarrier, Green Sea Ships, North Links Web, and MCT for their support as Wing Commander Tier patrons. Thank you all so much, and I'll catch you all next time.